All right, so uh, today, uh, a couple of administrative items as we get started. Uh, first, um, I can confirm one of the companies that we're going to be working with is Lockheed Martin. Uh, Mike Caballi, who used to be their um, head of investor relations, uh, now is a senior leader of the company, will be here on the 29th. He'll actually be in the section right before yours. We will record him on video and make it available for all to see. But he'll be coming in, he'll talk about Lockheed Martin, the defense and aerospace industry, and he's excited about, he's also a Smith alum, uh, about uh, coming back to Smith and, and seeing what kind of work we can do. He's also gonna help pick the companies that we're gonna do the valuation projects on. So he's the first confirmed company that I can definitely tell you about, and more to come. All right, <clears throat> so the other thing I wanna talk to you about is to the Bloomberg assignments. I posted last night Homework one and two, I also posted a Bloomberg frequently asked questions about the bat. So I want to start here with the bat. So again, registration for the bat is going to be at takethebat.com, right, to register. Now, as of Friday, Bloomberg is confirmed we have at least 10 people registered for all four of the bat uh, offering. So remember next week there's no physical class. The bat will be administered during class time. It starts at either 11, was it 11, 30, 11 a.m., 1.30, 11 a.m., 1.30 p.m., whatever it is. Um, but nonetheless, there'll be the bat on Monday and Wednesday during class time. So you will not be in here unless you're registering for the bat. Now, here's the thing. They're going to cap the bat at 40 to 45 people per section. And today... Uh, the bat went out to the General Smith community for anybody at the business school that wants to take it. And so if other people sign up for it, you could get locked out of taking the bat and lose your chance for extra credit. So my suggestion is if you do want to take it for extra credit, make sure you register sometime sooner rather than later because you will now be competing with other people who could choose the time slot that you want. So the other thing that I confirm with Bloomberg <clears throat> is that if you want to take the bat here, then, as I said, one, it doesn't cost you anything, it's free, and two, you can use it towards extra credit towards your midterm exam. So again, there's two-part midterm, each part 7.5% of your semester grade. You can apply the BAT towards one of the two parts of the midterm, get a perfect score. You can even choose which part to do it after you've taken the midterm. So you can even you know, take it, decide I want to put it on part B because I didn't know it was good, get a perfect score on part B. So that's the opportunity. Second opportunity is if you can't make it to the physical bat class and still want to take it, then you can take the bat online. All right? The online bat is the same test, but it costs $39, and you must take the bat um, <clears throat> by September 22nd, which is two weeks from today, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you must take and complete the bat online by that day. So if you register and take it in class, Bloomberg will give me a list. I'll know you took it. If you take it online, then you have to give me proof that you took it online and show me your BAT score. Okay. So just wanted to give you that update on the BAT. Right? I also posted to this link a series of BAT questions. So you can see what types of questions are on the BAT, sample questions and sample answers, and just some other general questions about the BAT. But very specifically, the one that's going to be administered in this room next week is a timed exam. So if they say it starts at 11, it starts at 11, ends at 1. So if you show up at 11.20, they don't give you the full two hours. You now have an hour and 40 minutes to take the 100 multiple choice questions. So there is no flexibility for the on-campus administered one. If you take it online, it's a two-hour clock as soon as you start and pay by credit card. So either way, 100 questions, two hours, that's the bad opportunity. The other thing is the Bloomberg <clears throat> taking the uh, Bloomberg assessment or sorry, Bloomberg um, certification, thank you. Uh, if you want to become Bloomberg certified, well, you're doing it for a grade, so you need to become Bloomberg certified, then the easiest way is if you log into Bloomberg, simplest way to get there is type BU to go to Bloomberg University, online training, view the training videos. Like I said, you watch the videos. So for the core, you'd watch these four videos and then you click on the core exam link. Now I know there's four core exam links, but there's only one core exam. 
right? So basically, I'd recommend watching all four of these before taking the core exam. Now, I've been using Bloomberg for a few years, and I tried taking the core exam last week just as a practice, and I scored 47% but I did it without watching any of the videos. And because the way that the questions are is, in the video, we told you to go to this screen to do this function. Which screen did we tell you to go to? And obviously, since I didn't watch the videos, I did not score very well, all right? So I'm just telling you, it is in your interest to watch the videos before you take the exam. Then the questions aren't all that difficult. But nonetheless, <clears throat> you can only take the exam twice. So if you miss it twice, you lose out on your, your opportunity for a grade. So basically, I'm sorry? What do we need again? 75%. Okay. So basically, you watch the four videos, you take the core exam, you click on any one of these links, take the same exam, it'll send you a PDF. You take the equity essentials, take this exam, it'll send you a PDF. This exam is worth three points, this equity exam is worth one point. Take the PDF, go back to Canvas, and that is now called Homework 2. So under the assignments for Homework 2, you would click on Homework 2, and you would upload both PDFs. And again, September 22nd, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So as I told you last week, homeworks are due on the Monday, usually following the Wednesday. So I'm just letting you know, Mondays, 10 a.m. is generally going to be the online deadline. Now, at 10.15 the link actually goes away. So I'm giving you a 15 minute grace period, but once that link goes away, there will be no exceptions of any files. Okay, so you have until 10.15, two weeks from today, to submit your PDFs. If you have trouble submitting them before then, email with a time and date stamp before that deadline. Right, because anything after that deadline will not count towards credit. So back to the Bloomberg Essentials. <clears throat> if you're taking the Bloomberg certification, which you will need to do, you'll need to go to either this room when we're not in class, or you'll have to go to the lab downstairs, and again, you got two weeks to do it. I mean, you got about two hours of video to watch, plus the uh, exams. Bloomberg certification does require being logged on to a Bloomberg terminal, so you can't do that one at home. You must do it in the lab. Right. Questions about Bloomberg certification or the back? Yes? I could be wrong about this, but uh, when I tried to get a PDF for just the core exam, they don't give you any kind of certification for it. It just says you, like, it'll show on the terminal that pass the exam, but there's no way to, they only give you an acknowledgement of it. If you do the other. I, I'm actually, had somebody else said the same thing, we're going to look into that, because okay. they're supposed to send you a PDF for the core exam. So <clears throat> we're going to ask them what they do. If not, you may just have to show me the, uh, yeah, like the P, take, take a screenshot. Them, yeah. yeah, but for now, I'm going to find out why they didn't send it to you, because they told me that they, they do, but they might not have correct information as well. But regardless, please take both. Yes. Yeah, so as I said, I'll, I'll call Bloomberg and I'll ask about it. But regardless, for now, start getting the certification. That's the most important thing. All right, good questions. All right, <clears throat> so today we're going to pretty much finish up Lecture 1. We did not get to Lecture 2 in either of the previous sections, so Wednesday we will cover Lecture 2. But uh, they have been posted under the Files section of Canvas. So where we left off last week is we had talked about the four cornerstones of value creation. And today we're going to talk about what we're going to call the key value drivers, or KVD. <clears throat> and we're going to show you some math in, in just a few minutes, but the key value drivers equation, as articulated by McKinsey in our textbook, is basically core to understanding principles of value creation. And this slide basically says, take the math out, and this is what key value drivers are. There's three key value drivers that we need to understand for any business. First is the concept of spread, right? And spread is the difference between your ROIC and cost of capital. To create value, you must have a positive spread. So again, internal rate of return greater than cost of capital, ROIC greater than your WAC, same principle. If you don't have that, you can't create value, right? So that's one of the core concepts we're going to cover. Concept number two is growth. And I want to be very specific here. Growth does not create value. And I'm going to say it again for the YouTube audience. Growth does not create value. All right? And some people think of that as a controversial statement because many of their professors that you've taken already have probably told you that growth creates lots of value. 
And here's the, the nuance. Let's say that I can borrow from a bank at 10% and make five. Should I do more of that? <clears throat> Growing that would be disastrous. So growth is an accelerant to value. Growth is like throwing gasoline on a fire. Matter of fact, I was watching over the weekend a news story where this woman went into an elementary school chemistry class and showed how to make like a, uh, a like a mini tornado with fire, and she took a jug of alcohol and she poured it on a butane flame, and it literally exploded, caused second degree and third degree burns to most of the elementary students in the class. Plus, it burned herself because the jar blew up. I'm not. I'm just curious. Like, what was she thinking? But in any event, that's growth. Growth is the gasoline on the fire, which will ignite and explode whatever the directionality of your spread is. So if you have a good spread and you grow it, you create a lot of value. If you have a good spread, or sorry, negative spread and you grow it, you destroy value at a faster rate. Growth is the accelerant. The third part is sustainability. Sustainability is going to be based on your competitive advantage. You will not <coughs> sustain things forever. This morning, I was on a conference call with Johnson Controls, and I'm going to do a session for them in Monterey, Mexico, first week of December. We've got to figure out the logistics of that one. But in any event, <clears throat> the point is what they want to talk about are examples of companies that are being disrupted and how they're handling disruption. And it's interesting that they referred to a, a book called Built to Last. Has anybody heard of this book, Built to Last? It's, it's popular in the management press and in the management departments. And it was written by these guys, Jim Collins and somebody else. Uh, but basically, they talked about companies that had been around for a long time and were going to be built for the next 100 years. And two of their examples were Polaroid and Kodak as the companies to emulate. And what I'm telling you is Polaroid and Kodak might be in a museum in 100 years. They might be there now, but the companies don't really exist today. So that's the point, is that figuring out how long a company is going to last, how long they're going to maintain their competitive advantage really matters because companies don't last forever and we can't assume that they do. So what is the length of their competitive advantage? When can they earn good rates of return? How long before their returns start to go down? That's going to be the third important concept. So spread, growth, sustainability of that spread, those are the core principles we need to understand for any business. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about spread, ROIC and cost of capital are two of the components of spread. There's two components of ROIC, margin and productivity, which we'll call cycle time. So ultimately, there's five things we're going to focus on. Margin, cycle time, risk, growth, competitive advantage. Those are the things that are going to matter the most. <clears throat> so... You heard of a guy named Warren Buffett, manages a company called Berkshire Hathaway, right? He's probably one of the more famous investors in the world today. Well, here's what you need to know about Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. That the DNA of Berkshire Hathaway is that of an insurance company. That Warren Buffett, a long time ago, started out as a Wharton undergrad, and he dropped out after one year because he realized that it was overpriced for the quality of education he was getting. And he went back and he completed his undergraduate degree somewhere in the Midwest. And then he went to Columbia. He got his MBA. And then he went back to Omaha, Nebraska, and they bought a company called Berkshire Hathaway, a boring, sleepy textile company that he quickly realized had no future because textiles were a dying business. And what he did is he used the cash from the textile business to figure out what to do next. And specifically, he decided that financial services were the growth and the future of the economy. So he started getting into the insurance business. And he started buying his first couple investments were these insurance companies in Nebraska. Eventually bought a company that you might have heard of called Geico. Right? It's a big Berkshire Hathaway company. But, but here's the point. At its heart, Berkshire Hathaway is an insurance company. And the reason I say that is because it's important to understand how do insurers make money. So how does an insurance company make money? Yeah. One is a portfolio and the other is premiums. So they're going to underwrite you to make sure they don't pay out too much in claims. But the portfolio is they're going to take the premiums, they're going to invest them. Think life insurance, 40, 50, 60 years before they have to pay it out. 
So how much money they make with their investment income is going to be very important. So here's the insight Warren Buffett had 30 or 40 years ago, which is if he hired smart math people from top schools, you're all going to create the same diversified portfolios and you're going to all earn the same amount of return. The only way he's going to do better is if he do it differently. Different to him, individual stocks. So he buys individual companies rather than diversified portfolios <clears throat> because he thinks he can outperform the market because he disagrees with the academic world. He does not believe the market is efficient. He does not believe the market has perfect information. He does not believe that the market perfectly prices companies. And he thinks that that can be exploited, particularly in the short run. So, number one, he doesn't invest in things that he also doesn't understand. No black boxes. I have to understand the business model of how the company is actually going to make money. And I have to believe they're actually going to make money, intrinsic value. But more importantly, he has two rules when he invests in companies. Because again, if I'm an insurer, I'm going to match the duration of my portfolio with the duration of my investments. So the idea is, if I'm looking at a long-term payout, I want a long-term investment. So when he invests in a company, he's thinking 30 to 40 years, I'm going to be in this company. I'm not just going to trade it out in 18 months. I want a company that's going to do well for a long period of time. So rule number one in investments, find good industries. Right? What I want to figure out <clears throat> is what industry is going to do well for 30 years. Because if I have a bad industry, no matter how well run the company is, they're not going to overcome the lousy industry. So I have to find a good industry. Rule number two, find the best managed companies in that industry. Right? So what in Wall Street and on Silicon Valley, they have a saying. We invest in A teams with B plans before we invest in A plans with B teams. We bet on people. Well, he does as well. He knows that he's not the guy to come in and run your business. All right, that was Eddie Lampert when he bought Sears, the hedge fund manager that's driven Sears into near bankruptcy. Because he's like, oh, I'm a hedge fund manager, therefore I can run a retail empire. All right, Warren Buffett realizes hedge fund managers should not run businesses. So that's the point. He wants a good management team in place that knows a lot about the business, that knows how to execute. Give me a good team and a good industry, and I will outperform over the long run. That has been his philosophy. So let's talk about a couple of his investments just to illustrate the point. Give me an example of somebody Warren Buffett's bought recently, Berkshire Hathaway, outside of Burger King, who we talked about last week. Oh, yeah. Heinz. I'm sorry? Heinz. Heinz Ketchup. All right. How boring. <laughs> Yet he thinks ketchup is sexy. Ketchup is a sexy business. The condiment industry. For the next 30 years, it's a growth opportunity. Why? And as you think about that question, you'll start to understand that finance is about adopting a point of view and articulating your assumptions along the way. So what's the exciting nature of the industry of Heinz? Anybody uses ketchup, but what else? Why is it going to grow so much? Yeah. I think expanding it now, there's like jalapeno ketchup. They make all these different ketchup. They do. They do have a lot of different flavors of ketchup. But just ketchup itself is a growth business. We're going to be spreading it everywhere. Yeah. It's emerging markets. And here's the data. It's a data-driven approach. That's another key point. What he knows is that in emerging markets, countries are getting wealthier. Think India, think China, think uh, Brazil, think Mexico. As people get wealthier, they put more protein in their diet. Heinz is a protein play. And the key is that owning the protein, the meat that people eat, the slaughterhouses, is a horrible business. So what he did is he found a business completely correlated to protein, the condiment business, that's going to grow with the growth of protein. And so basically, he's made a protein play. And then he said, find the sleepy business that nobody thought about that's a terrific brand because no matter where you go in the world today, you run across Heinz. So he bought the best company with the best brand that's a protein play. That's Warren Buffett. That's his business. That's how he starts. Who else has he bought recently, Coke. last couple of years? Coke. Coke he bought back in the 80s. That's been a long time ago. But here's the point. Why did he buy Coke back in the 80s? Sorry, is, is a growth. I forgot, it's an astronomical statistic, but Coke is something like 10 or 12% of all the beverages consumed in the world today are Coca Cola product. And he saw the growth in consumption. And he also believed in the addictive qualities of sugar because they know you're coming back. 
right? So he bought a company that's basically, he loved the addicts, sugar addicts. But who's he bought recently? I'll give you another example. You heard of Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad? He thinks railroads are sexy, to paraphrase that, that country song. You think your tractor's sexy? He thinks your railroads are sexy. Why? Why are railroads, which have been around for 150 years, why does he look at that as such a growth business? Yeah. Not just flying, it's also cheaper than what? Cheaper than trucking. So it's a bet on global trade. <clears throat> and particularly, it's very expensive, particularly if you think about the U.S., to get goods in this country via air. There's some air cargo, but most of the stuff is going to come via boat. And then when it lands, it's either going to get to us from the boat, either by car or truck or by train. And here's another point of view, $100 barrel oil. He believes that energy costs are going to remain high in the future, even with fracking. And by the way, I, told, I think I mentioned this last week, but remember, fracking causes earthquakes. Okay? And fracking is going to have a lot of negative press coming up. Matter of fact, the whole state of Oklahoma is rumbling on a daily basis because of all the fracking that they're doing. They went from no seismic activity to like earthquakes of three and four magnitude on a every single day basis. All of a sudden, it's because the whole state is being hydraulically fracked. And the only reason the people in Oklahoma aren't complaining about it is one in six jobs in Oklahoma are tied to the fracking industry. Right? Matter of fact, we're having the same problem in western Pennsylvania, northern West Virginia. That border has fallen by three feet right? because of all the stuff that they pumped out of the ground. And it's making the ground unstable. All right? So I'm just telling you, it's not the well water that we're going to hear about. It's the earthquakes that the industry is trying to disavow. But the data is going to be hard to go past. But in any event, regardless of fracking, he still believes, even if fracking continues, there's still going to be more demand than supply for energy. Energy costs remain high. Think above $100 barrel oil long term. So at that energy cost, rail has a 10 to 15% cost advantage over trucking. So that is huge competitive advantage that allows rail to grow long term. As a matter of fact, does anybody know the fastest growing part of rail today? It, and it's not oil. Coal's actually going off a cliff because the Obama administration has done their best to ban coal. So, so coal truckloads or car loads are going down dramatically. So basically oil is replacing coal. Although right now, oil's kind of on hold because when they crash, they blow up and explode. So because we're not building pipelines, they're actually picking up oil. But that's not even the fastest growing part of, of trains. Does everybody know what it is? Something called intermodal transportation. Trucks on trains. Is that even the trucking industry has realized it's too expensive to ship things long term on 18 wheelers. So what they're doing is they're literally putting the 18 wheelers on the trains. And the innovation in the rail industry is double stacking. They literally put two 18-wheelers on top of each other from the port. They train it to the last few miles. They then drive it off to the final place. And the trucking industries are coordinating with the trains to move stuff long term. What I'm telling you is Warren Buffett foresaw this happening five years ago when oil prices started getting high. And he saw that everybody was going to try and go to rail for long-term transportation. And he got ahead of that trend. So <clears throat> that was point number one. Point number two is why Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Okay? Now, there's basically four regional monopolies of rail in the U.S. In the Northeast, you have Norfolk Southern. In the Southeast, you have CSX. In the Northwest, you have Union Pacific. In the Southwest, you have Burlington Northern Santa Fe. It goes from California through Texas and right into the Gulf of Mexico. Why do you think he picked Burlington Northern Santa Fe? China and Mexico. That's right. It's all Asia and Mexico. It was NAFTA, everything coming up through Texas. That had Burlington Northern's trains, which interconnects with everybody else. And all the stuff coming from Asia docks at the West Coast ports. It's all going through Burlington Northern's network. So I'm just saying he chose a structural long-term advantage in an industry that's growing that everybody wants to go towards rail that has a cost long-term competitive advantage. And you wonder why the guy's a billionaire. I'm just saying this is why this week we're going to talk about EIC, because we need to understand how changes in the economy, industry structure, and competitive advantage lead to good, sustained, long-term performance. 
because if we can find those elements in a company, we can find companies that will outperform over a long period of time. So <clears throat> here's another key point I want to make, which is true story. <clears throat> I'm still working with both of these companies. These are real companies. This story happened in 2008. So I'm sitting in a classroom at the Wharton School in Philadelphia, and Company A senior leadership was in the room. <clears throat> and the topic was talking about what's driving their share price. And the CFO of Company A just asked a question. And he basically said, <clears throat> um, why is our stock price not going up as fast as our competitors, which was Company B? And he said, basically, you know, you deal with the Wall Street people, and, and you know, we're all looking at the same numbers. <clears throat> he said, look, we make the same products. We have the same risk. We have the same profit margins. They both made 8% profit margins. And they're growing at the same rate. And they're expected to continue to grow at the same rate. And he's like, everything that I've said, the analysts agree with. So why is my stock price not going up as fast as B's? B's is going up a lot faster. Mine's not going anywhere. They got buys on them and holds on me. And I basically said, what's your cycle time? And he said, what do you mean by cycle time? Because cycle time is not a term used in the financial community. That is a Professor Joe Perfetti invention. Because I believe in simplified language. Right? The rest of the world calls this productivity. Right? So what they'll say is, <clears throat> it's kind of like when I talk to my dog. You know, if you have a pet, you talk to your animal, and your animal seems to listen to you, but there's no comprehension. Right? Well, that's the way most people listen to the finance organization is that you'll go into a manufacturing environment and you'll say, let's get our, our inventory turns from seven to eight. Is that good, by the way? Going from seven to eight. Inventory turns. Yeah. Seems to people in this room are like, hmm, I don't really know the answer to that question. I should know the answer to that question, but I've blocked it out. And others are like, all right, yes, it is. And then everybody else is starting to nod because you think it's the right thing to say. But most of you have no idea. But here's the thing. If I told you that the amount of inventory we had goes from 40 days to 35 days, is that understandable? It's about language. And that's the point. We, we have to make the language clearly understood at companies. So the language that I use is cycle time. And what cycle time represents is productivity. And specifically, it says, how long does it take to turn a dollar of investment, dollar borrowed money, invested capital, into a dollar of collected cash from a customer? How long does that take? So there's a formula that we can use to measure this. As a matter of fact, it's on this page, which I forgot to put in the original PowerPoint. But this is the formula. And it says you need to know two pieces of information. You need to know how much borrowed money you have, invested capital. And then you need to know your annual revenue or annual sales. If you divide, it gives you the percentage of the year that you're tying up the financing. And I just multiply by 365 to turn that into days. The rest of the world flips this formula. They do sales divided by investment. I do investment divided by sales and then multiply by 365. All right? So that gives me days of cycle time. Now, here's why this is important. I gave the same definition I gave to you, to their senior leadership and their CFO. They got it immediately. They knew what I was talking about once I showed them the formula. I was like, all right, who's got the better cycle time, you or your competitor? So we decided to look it up. We got out the annual reports. We got the financial statements, we calculated it using publicly available data, and we got the, this slide. This slide came out of that meeting. And what it said was Company A's cycle time was 267 days, that's who I was talking to. Their competitor was 135. So here's the business model. For the same risk, A makes $0.08 cents of cash profit every 267 days, because that's how long it takes to turn a dollar of investment into a dollar of collected cash. B makes $0.08 cents every 135 days. Where would you put your money? B. Even A, Company A, admitted that B might look more attractive to an investor. Frustrated them, but they even admitted it. And that was the point. That's what the investors focused on. Now, I want you to think about just the cash implications here. So let's say A and B start their projects on the same day. On day 135, how much cash profit does A have? It's actually zero. It's not four cents. On a piece of paper somewhere, some accountant would be writing four cents. But that's not the cash. That's the accounting. They're not done. The whole point is how long does it take to get the cash back? Day 135, A has nothing. What about B? 
They get a dollar of revenue. They spent 92 cents of cash. They now net eight cents of cash. What does A have on day 267? Eight cents. What does B have on day 270? 16. So it's not just how much you make, it's how often you make it. So what we do for comparative purposes when we put these two numbers together is we annualize the data for comparative purposes. So eight cents every 267 days is about 11 cents a year. Eight cents every 135 days is about 22 cents a year. Would you rather have 22 cents a year or 11 cents a year? Pretty easy decision. That annualized number is called ROIC. Return on invested capital is the annualized cash you generate, which is a function of your margin and your cycle time, which are the two key drivers of ROIC. And so A and B had the same products at the same margin at the same risk, but B was doing it twice as fast. Now A is a company called Raytheon, B is Lockheed Martin, and Mike Gabali from Lockheed Martin, who's going to be here working with us, used to be head of investor relations for Lockheed Martin. So he can give you a little insight into B's, what I would call, competitive advantage. But part of it comes from the fact that a long time ago, both these companies sell most of their products to the government. And there's a limit on what the government's going to let you charge them. There's no limit on how efficient you are in running your business. So Lockheed Martin realized this a long time ago, and they are the efficiency company. Matter of fact, if you're an engineer at Lockheed Martin, one of the first things they do is they make you go to green belt training. Does anybody know what that is? It's not a karate class. Green belt training. Every engineer at Lockheed Martin, they got almost 100,000 of them, goes through a minimum green belt training. It's Six Sigma class. They've embraced lean thinking and manufacturing principles. They teach spiral project management. It's all about productivity and efficiency and how time really is money and how they need to be as efficient as possible. So the way this played out in 2008 is at the time, both companies had $16 billion of invested capital. Raytheon had $21 billion in revenue. Lockheed Martin had $43 billion in revenue. They had twice the revenue for the same investment. Why? Because they had to be more efficient with what they do. So that's where productivity comes into play. We can measure it financially. Matter of fact, <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm making you get Bloomberg certified is once you're certified, I can give you a custom template because Bloomberg allows us to customize formulas. And what I can do, if I go into Bloomberg here, if I go to LMT, U.S. Equity, and I go to the RV screen where I can quickly compare people, I can go to this custom template which I have created with these with some custom formulas called operating ROIC and this will show me the operating ROIC today for the defense and aerospace industry. So here's the thing. Today Lockheed Martin has a 7% profit margin. Raytheon today has a 9% profit margin. Raytheon's more profitable than Lockheed Martin today. They were even five years ago. But here's what's interesting. Cycle time at Lockheed Martin 125 days. Cycle time at Raytheon improved, but it's still 229 days. So when you annualize the numbers, Lockheed Martin makes 21 cents in cash per year, Raytheon makes 14. And that's what the investment community cares about, because ROIC is eventually cash flow. And that gets me more cash flow, therefore gets me more value. So these become two key drivers of understanding the performance of any business. Questions, comments, make sense? By the way, Boeing is the outlier in this industry because they also make commercial jets. And they just can't, you know, make the 737s fast enough. So basically, that's the commercial side of their business. Take it out, you're a government contractor, their numbers look a lot worse. All right. <clears throat> Let's go back to this. So, hypothetical company to define a, a few more terms. <clears throat> The book talks about no pat, no plat, so I'm not going to really define that. I assume you've read the book and you understand that. But basically, no pat is what the rest of the world calls it. No plat is what McKinsey calls it. Those are interchangeable terms. So let's assume we have $100 million worth of no plat or no pat. And let's assume that $50 million of the no plat is reinvested in the business 
and the other 50 million of the no plat is returned to investors, excuse me, in the form of a dividend. That creates two key ratios called the investment rate or reinvestment rate, the percentage of the profits reinvested, 50% is the number here, and 50% payout rate, the numbers that is paid out. All right. So since we're talking about no plat relative to invested capital, ROIC, invested capital is debt and equity. So the reinvestment here is technically the cash that goes to the debt and the equity holder. Sorry, the payout is technically the cash that goes to the debt and equity holders. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that this firm doesn't have any debt and it's just all a dividend. Just keep it simple. But eventually, it's the cash that goes to the debt and equity holders. That's the payout rate we're talking about here. Now, <clears throat> in this case, this company, just 50-50 to keep it simple, I'm going to go on and I'm going to define two more terms. I'm going to define growth, little g, in our equations, also known as the sustainable growth rate, or what some people call the organic growth rate of a firm. And I'm going to define <clears throat> free cash flow. So let's start out with growth. Growth, or little g, is how fast my cash flow grows over time. So this hypothetical company, which is reinvesting 50 million of its cash, new assumption, 10% ROIC. It's made 10% in the past. It's going to make 10% in the future. Just pick 10%. Nice round, easy number. Okay. So if I reinvest 50 million at 10%, I'm going to get 5 million of new profits on my new investment. So if my business made 100 million dollars and it keeps making 10%, it's going to make $100 million next year on the initial assets. If I reinvest $50 million at 10%, I'll get $5 million of new profits. I have $105 million next year. I'll grow my business at 5%. Everybody see that mechanically? Here's the shortcut. The shortcut for sustainable growth rate is to take the investment rate, which is 50%, times the ROIC, which is 10%, equals sustainable growth rate. 10% of 50% is 5%. That is the theoretical growth rate that I can grow internally without extra funds. Because remember that the investment rate and the payout rate have to add up to 100%. Okay? So in this case, since I'm taking half of the money and I'm paying out, I have the other half to reinvest. So that's 50%. I make 10% on the reinvestment. That allows me to sustainably grow with internal funds at 5% a year. That's the 5%. This is a very powerful insight to have. So here's how I applied this insight. So I was <clears throat> working with this company last year, and they were explaining to me their, their vision for the future. And they had heard from, again, the management people that they needed to have BHAGs. Let me know what a BHAG is. I guess I'm talking to a bunch of finance majors. The management people call BHAGs big, hairy, audacious goals. Right? That's what you're missing in the management electives. So they're basically stretch goals for your organization. So you want to give a goal that's really hard to achieve, so that way the organization stretches itself in order to do better than they think they can do. Okay? Almost every reality TV show is basically a BHAG. Right? So here's the idea. They had to have their own BHAGs. So they went to the board. And the board created their stretch goals for their balanced scorecard that they then had to explain to their organization. And I was going to be brought in to help explain it to their next level of leadership down. And the CEO gave me the list of the BHAGs. And he's like, all right, let's talk through these. And I said, first, you need to go back to your board because you can't achieve them. You cannot hit this list. Now, if you tell the CEO that he's wrong, you better be right. All right. So this is what the CEO told me. We want to grow at 15% a year. We want to sustain an ROIC of 15% or higher a year. We want to pay out 50% of the cash we generate in either div dividends or share repurchase, some combination or other, target payout rate of 50%. We're going to do all this with internally generated funds, so no M&A, all organic growth. And we're interested in protecting our credit rating, so we're not going to issue any new debt because we think we can do it all with organic growth all with internally generated funds. So why did I tell him he couldn't do this? And why did I know that I was right? Yes? Um, 
I'm just listing out logic and they're not buying new companies, their maximum sustainable growth rate is seven point five one percent. That's right. Their maximum sustainable growth rate is only seven and a half percent. How did you know that? How did I know that? Fifty percent times fifteen percent. That's right, because if the payout rate is fifty percent, then the investment rate must be fifty percent. If the investment rate is fifty percent and the ROIC is fifteen, half of fifteen is seven and a half. So the problem is they can't achieve this target. Something is wrong. And what I'm telling you, and by the way, this is part B of your midterm. So part A is can you do the math? Part B is do you know what the math is telling you? Okay. So these are the types of questions you, you need to start to understand. This is the insight that should be coming out of being a good analyst. So let's go back to the previous example. What if this hypothetical company A has a new CEO and she demands 10% growth? How do you get there? How do we get this G to be 10%? Yeah. If you don't pay out the shareholders anything, you reinvest everything. So you reinvest how much? 100%. 100% times 10% is 10% growth. But here's the problem. You slash the dividend you get a rebellion from your shareholders. For some reason, people don't like when the dividend gets cut. So practically, it's very difficult for a big company to cut its dividend. So if I don't cut my dividend, what do I do? Yep. Go find projects that make 20%. I know every project that we make averages 10, double it overnight. Right? How easy is that? It's impractical. So, but that's the challenge that the company would face. But that's the point. If I get good returns, I can grow faster with internal generated funds. Why do you think Google and Facebook and Apple don't need any debt? Because they have phenomenal returns on investment of their core business, which allows them to grow internally and generate still hordes of cash beyond that. Right? So, <clears throat> second definition off this page. Free cash flow. The value of a business is not its future profits. Again, let me say this because I'm, I'm being recorded on YouTube. The value of a business is not its future profits. And I'm sure you've, you're probably like, hmm, that's not what my last professor said. <clears throat> Here's why. You can't take those profits and pay them out because you need to take at least some of that cash and reinvest it. Even if you don't grow, your business is going to fall apart if you don't at least maintain what you got. So some of those profits have to be reinvested. And if you grow, you need even more of those profits to be reinvested to allow you to sustain and grow. So profit after reinvestment is called free cash flow. That is what the theoretical value of your business is based on. Right? And that is not what the accountants give us. The accountants give us profit. The accountants do not give us free cash flow. To really understand the business, we need free cash flow. That is going to be what you're going to struggle with in two weeks. That's the rearranging of the financial statements. To put it into an economic format of free cash flow that tells us the real underlying nature of the business. Right? So <clears throat> free cash flow is basically the cash coming from the income statement, which the book at McKinsey calls gross cash flow. Some people call cash from operations, but it's a specialized version of cash from operations, minus reinvestment in the balance sheet, reinvestments in invested capital, so it's the change in the balance sheet. All right? So we're going to formally define this in two weeks. But basically, the difference is called free cash flow, and it's the free cash flow that equals the theoretical payout rate. So free cash flow equals the theoretical payout rate of the business. The reason this business could pay out 50% or $50 million worth of payout is because it had 50% or $50 million worth of free cash flow. Okay? Now it's called the theoretical payout rate because companies don't always pay out 100% of their free cash flow. So what happens if I don't pay out my free cash flow? What happens to the cash? It actually piles up on the balance sheet. So last year, Apple finally started paying a dividend. 
Last year, Apple bought back $10 billion worth of stock in 2012, so two years ago. So Apple paid out almost $20 billion of cash in 2012 to investors. But Apple generated $50 billion worth of free cash flow. So what happened to their cash balance? Yeah. It went up. Yeah, it went to retain earnings. They retained the cash, and specifically their cash balance went up. So the whole point was people were saying, Apple, get rid of the cash hoard. They paid out this giant dividend. They bought back a bunch of stock, and their cash hoard expanded even further. <clears throat> so this year, they've actually increased the share buybacks because they decided they needed to pay out more of their free cash flow. But that's the point, <clears throat> is that what we really want to understand is not just the cash flow, but how much is a free cash flow is the company generating, because that tells us what they could theoretically pay it out. Now, Apple is not paying it all out, and we know this because of what we talked about last Wednesday. Why? Why isn't Apple paying it out? Yeah. Because of the tax reasons. So they realize that all the cash they're earning outside the U.S., if they bring it back to the U.S. to pay it out and distribute it, they'd have to take a 35% hit on it. So basically, Apple's leaving it overseas so that they don't have to take the tax hit. Ironically, Apple is borrowing money, borrowing 40 or $50 billion worth of debt to pay the dividend and buy back the stock because all of their cash hoard is outside the U.S. and they don't want to pay taxes on it. Now, they're getting a phenomenally low interest rate in the debt because they're probably less risky than the U.S. government right now because the U.S. government has the, we seem to have the will of the government to pay bill risk which is new, where our government doesn't actually want to pay its bills because we just want to argue with each other and look good in the press to our constituencies. But nonetheless, Apple's actually getting a pretty good rate on its bonds right now because basically it's got cash against the bonds. It's just sitting outside the U.S. that they could pay back, but they don't want to because they don't want to pay the tax rate. So they're actually borrowing money against their cash at a very low rate to pay it out. But in any event, <clears throat> the key is free cash flow is what matters to value. Now, I want to go back to our company A simplistic example, and I'm going to add a company B to this list, and this is actually another critical point for the semester to understand this concept. So I'm adding a company B, which is a peer of company A. These are made-up companies. But here's the point. Same cost of capital, <clears throat> exact same profits, growing at the same rate, expected to continue in the future. So both companies are growing at 5%, identical profits, expected to continue. Same profit, same growth, same risk. Which of these two companies would be more valuable, A or B? All right, I heard some Bs. Why is B more valuable than A? It's accomplishing the same level of growth on this, a half of this growth. Yeah, I'm just repeating it for the purpose of the video. He said it's accomplishing the same level of growth for half the reinvestment. So specifically, B generates more free cash flow than A for the same profits. Everybody see that? Follow this, the why. B does not have to invest as much to generate the same profits. The reason is because B is better at what they do and B has a higher return on its investments. Because they have a higher return, they don't have to spend as much to generate the same profits. Therefore, they generate more free cash flow. Therefore, they generate more cash flow. So here's the key. At the same level of growth, more ROIC equals more free cash flow. Free cash flow, hard. It's not reported by the accountants. It's not something most companies track at least as a metric that goes beyond a few finance people, and it's just hard to figure out. ROIC, easy. ROIC is the proxy for free cash flow. They eventually have to equate at the same level of growth. Now, what makes it a little trickier is when the growths are different, right? and that gets more real world, but what I'm telling you is ROIC is a proxy otherwise for your free cash flow, and that's what we're seeing represented here. So the reason B is more valuable is because they have a higher ROIC. Now, I could have shown this to you in a slightly more obvious way, which is if I said if A and B invest the same amount and B gets a better return on investment, then B would have more profits. Well, that would have been really obvious. But I'm showing you something a little bit more subtle that says the same thing. 
at the same profits, B doesn't have to invest as much. Either way, B is going to generate more free cash flow than A. Either way, B is going to be a more valuable company. Everybody see that? So <clears throat> that is a very key insight I want you guys to have this semester. That's why we're going to spend so much time on ROIC. One of the things that McKinsey does is rather than forecast free cash flow directly, they teach you to forecast ROICs, which is forecasting free cash flow, but in a more insightful way. Okay? So <clears throat> here's another insight, continuing value. The difference between a project and a company is we assume companies last forever, which means we have to predict their cash flows forever. <clears throat> so on Friday, I'll have 70 people from Google in a room. <clears throat> and one of the questions I'm going to ask them, because I have to sound somewhat interesting, because I get my, my funny finance humor that they chuckle at. I'm not like the, the very funny guy. But in any event, is I'll say, so what's your revenue going to be in the year 2050? And everybody will be like, we don't know. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. <clears throat> Cheap jokes, I know. But uh, in any event, but that's the point. If, if I value Google, I need to know what their revenue is going to be in 2050. But you might as well throw a dart at a board. Spin the wheel. They don't even know. Right? So that's the problem. How do you actually predict this? So what we do in finance is we go out a few years and then we create something called a continuing value period where it's too hard to predict you into the future, but we still have to. So what we do is we use a formula called a growing perpetuity, bottom of this page, to value companies long term. Cash flow divided by R minus G. Okay? So I need to know the cash flow, which is the free cash flow. I need to know the discount rate, which is the cost of capital. And I need the long-term sustainable growth rate, the G. Okay? So that's the formula that people use for continuing value in the world today. That's what you're taught in business school. That's what people use professionally. That formula is flawed. Here's the flaw. <clears throat> that formula assumes that the internal rate of return on future investments equals the internal rate of return on historical investments. So if I apply this to Google, Google right now is firing on all cylinders. And the problem with Google is it means they're going to fire on all cylinders forever. They will never do poorly. I will overvalue Google. I will exaggerate them into perpetuity. <clears throat> if I apply this to a cyclical business at the downward part of their cycle, I will undervalue that company because they will never improve their business I will always just have bad performance forever. So the problem with this formula, which is used by the pros, is that it exaggerates the current directionality of the performance of the business. It will overvalue and undervalue you for that reason. Yet this is what people use. And we know that eventually there's going to be a regression to the mean. So <clears throat> this is why McKinsey makes the big bucks. This is their insight. They rearrange the growing perpetuity equation into what they call the key value drivers equation. This was what the reading was about this week. KVD for short. And they made two substitutions. Substitution number one, cash flow is free cash flow. And we know by definition that free cash flow is profit after reinvestment. Profit times one minus the investment rate. That's free cash flow. We also know that sustainable growth is the investment rate times the ROIC. Therefore, the investment rate is the growth over the ROIC. So the formula on the right is a growing perpetuity rearranged. And it's something McKinsey calls key value drivers formula. It's, it is a growing perpetuity. But notice the difference. Now, ROIC is explicit. That ROIC is an incremental ROIC for the future. So it's one ROIC for the entire future of the business. right? But at least it can be different than the past. So it can be at least more representative of what the future returns look like. That's one of their insights. Insight number two, it's about language. If I walk into an organization and I ask you what your free cash flow is, most people have no idea what I'm talking about. If I walk into your organization and I ask you what your profits are and your return on investment is, I can get answers and people intuitively understand that. So they actually use language which is more practical for the average person within a firm. That's how they make the big bucks. All right? It's insightful and it's straightforward, all right? and it's intuitive. All right? But nonetheless, this formula is extremely powerful. And we're going to use it to help us really understand what's happening this semester and beyond in terms of company's performance. So <clears throat> out of this question. You're talking about how do I calculate the cash flow? 
in either version, you use free cash flow, which is profit minus reinvestment. And to calculate it, and that's what I said, we're going to go through in two weeks a very formal process to calculate free cash flow. And it's basically going to be gross cash flow, which is no plat plus depreciation, minus gross investment, which is investment in working capital, operating working capital, PP&E, which is called CapEx. Is that a of and, well, it's a nuance, and acquisition premiums. And here's the problem. When Bloomberg does free cash flow, because Bloomberg actually will calculate free cash flow for you, the general definition that's used in the community is profit minus CapEx. They don't look at change in working capital, and they should. They don't look at investment acquisition premiums, and they should. And just a practical example of this, I was talking with the CFO of Novellus last week, because I'm going to do some work in Atlanta for them later this later in September, September, October. Anyways, Novellus is like the second largest aluminum producing company in the world after Alcoa. They're bought by an Indian company called Hindalco. <clears throat> but here's the thing. You may not know who Novellus is, but you use their products. Because if you buy a can of Coke or Pepsi, they make the aluminum in that can. They also make, and this is new for them, but the F-150 truck, I don't know if anybody's seen this, is going all aluminum. They actually make the aluminum that they're selling to Ford to make the F-150. So it's a growth business for them as we go to an aluminum world for an iron world. Long story short, let's come back to uh, free cash flow. So I'm talking to their CFO, and he's talking to me about their CapEx. And when I go down there, I'm going to talk to them about their free cash flow. But what he said is, we don't talk about working capital. And because we're using a lot of our people are using the standard definitions of CapEx, but they don't realize that working capital is a big chunk of the reinvestment of our business. Working capital is tying up money in inventory, tying up money on how long it takes Ford to pay them when they sell them the aluminum. That actually adds to the cash flow. So what I'm just telling you is I'm going to give you a much more formal, insightful definition that even some of the analysts lazily, I think, skip over because people take shortcuts. So I'm not saying that people are right or wrong when they give you the shortcuts. But by the time you finish this class, you'll know that somebody's taken a shortcut because you'll know the formal definition and you'll know the difference of why they're doing it the way they do it. All right, so I don't want you going to your other professors questioning them saying, you're doing it wrong. It's a bad idea for your grade. Right? You're too young in your careers. But what I am telling you is that they might be doing it for a reason and at least you'll start to get an insight as to why they're doing it, and most of the time it's for convenience. All right, but I'm going to give you the formal definition. And by the way, the formal definition sucks because it revolves a lot of extra work. All right, and that's what we're going to go through in two weeks. But back to this. So we said that A would be worth more than B. I want to prove it. How much more on this slide is A, or sorry, B was worth more than A, how much more, using this formula, I want to quantify it. Right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Excel. I have A and I have B. I'm going to do a little simulation. Using the key value driver equation here on the right from McKinsey, there's four factors in it. I'm going to simplify the language. Profit. Sorry, I didn't mean to shout at you. Profit. Growth. Return. Risk. I'm just using simple words, but basically no plat, G, ROIC, cost of capital. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that will give me value. A and B both have 100 million. Start. A and B are both growing at 5% per year sustainably. Return on invested capital at A is 10%. Return on invested capital at B is 20%. And the cost of capital for both is 10. So using the key value drivers formula equals no plat times 1 minus growth divided by ROIC. Divide that by the WAC minus the growth. Business A is worth a billion dollars. Business e, B is worth a billion five. Business B is worth 50% more than A. So intuitively, we thought B should be more valuable. I'm just quantifying it. Now, in the real world, <clears throat> these companies have publicly traded, or even if not, would trade at a price-to-earnings multiple. 
What is the PE multiple of business A? 10. Because their price would be their value. Their earnings would be their profit. They would trade at a multiple of 10. They would trade at a multiple of 15. What you need to understand is that ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. Multiples are a proxy for free cash flow valuation. ROIC is easy. Free cash flow is hard. Multiples are easy. DCF is hard. That's why people like multiples. But here's the thing. Regardless of whether you do a DCF valuation or a multiple valuation, you have to get the same answer. You can't change your methodology and get a different result. The company's worth what the company's worth, no matter how we choose to value it. We still have to come up with the same answer. That's one of the things you're going to see this semester. By the end of the semester, you're going to do three methods of valuing a company. You're going to do cash flow, you're going to do economic value added, called EP, and you're going to do multiples. And you have to consistently come up with the same answer regardless of your approach because it's just rearranging the math. Right? And so that's the key is in the real world, we like multiples. How much do we pay as a multiple of earnings? So what I want to start to understand is what is going to drive changes in value and changes in earnings. But before I do, here's something that I want to point out. We said B is more valuable than A. What's different? The only thing that's different on this page is ROIC, its return. And that results in a higher multiple and therefore a higher stock price. Return dry stock price. It's one of the factors. Now, <clears throat> what happens if the cash profit of A doubles? So instead of 100 million a year, they start making 200 million a year. Everything else stays the same. Same long-term growth rate, same return, same risk, just double the cash profits overnight, magically, whatever happens. Shock in the system. What happens to the value of the business? What happens to the multiple of business? Ad? Or what if here? All right, let's see. Here's 200 million. Here's 300 million. Here's 400 million. Now let's look at B. Here's 200 million. Here's 300 million. Here's 400 million. A and B are more valuable because they're absolutely generating more cash flow. But how much I pay for that cash flow is not changing. The multiple's not changing. So, another way of saying it what drives multiples? Well, it's not the level of cash profit. I'm more valuable because I generate more cash flow. But every dollar of profit becomes more valuable because of something else. The drivers of multiple are here. Starts with growth and spread. Remember I started the day. Growth, spread, sustainability. It's spread and growth. Spread is ROIC and cost of capital. And growth become the value drivers for a firm. You talk to me about those three things, I'll tell you what's going to happen to a company's stock price. That's where you're going to be in the next few weeks. So <clears throat> let's go back. I'll start from where we did the initial example. What happens if business A finds a way to start growing faster sustainably than B? So maybe they expand into Asia and B just stays in North America. So they get faster growth. What happens to the value of A if their growth rate is sustainably higher but nothing else changes? What should happen? What should happen to value? What should happen to multiple? You got two choices. Actually, three choices. Up, down, stay the same. All right, I see a bunch of ups. Suddenly we get quiet because we're on video here. All right. Here's 6%, here's 7%, here's 8%, here's 9%. Let's try this again. 
Here's 6%, here's 6%, here's 7%, here's 7%, here's 8%, 8%, 9%, 9%. What's going on here? Yeah, so, so the return and the risk are the same, therefore, I'm sorry, you're going to add, therefore the spread is zero. I like to call this the treadmill. You work really hard, but you don't go anywhere. And eventually you get tired and you fall off. So that's, by the way, this is what keeps me employed. Because I get so many companies who are like, we're growing really fast and we're putting all this money into our business. Why isn't our stock price going anywhere? It's because you have lousy returns for the growth. And the market's just not valuing the growth. It's the growth and return combination. So I'm borrowing a 10. I'm making 10. Am I really giving you any value? I get zero spread here. It's zero NPV. I'm growing zero NPV projects. Why is it different at B? What's different about company B? Yeah. And so basically, I'm borrowing a 10. I'm making 20. I want to do more of that. You know, crunch all you want, we'll make more. So, <clears throat> that's what's key. Scenario number three. Reset this. What if, instead of growing at 5%, I announce I'm only going to grow at 3%? I didn't meet investor expectations. Sorry. I told you I was going to hit this growth rate, but I didn't. Market conditions have changed. What's going to happen? I'm still going to get the same return. I'm just not going to grow as fast. And it's not the take longer. The, the real challenge here is I priced you as if you were going to hit this growth and this return. Now, expectations aren't as good as what I thought. And so therefore, with the new data, I price you at a lower expectation. Stock price goes down. So even though you have a great rate of return that doesn't change, you aren't getting as much of it as I thought, therefore you're worth less. This is the principle of expectation at work. This is what happened last week. I use a, a, a product called Evernote to track news articles, which I also sometimes post on Twitter. But when Tesco, which is the British version of uh, Walmart, basically went to the market and said, profit warning, we're not going to hit our growth rate. So, oh, by the way, we're not going to hit our growth rate and we can't pay the dividend that we promised you. So we're going to have to slash the dividend. Well, you can guess what happened to their stock price, all right? But here's the other thing. We now know some math behind this headline. Why did they have to slash the growth rate? Or sorry, why did they have to slash the dividend? Exactly, because they had to reinvest more to maintain the growth that they were having trouble achieving. And that was the point. They had to cut back the payout rate to get the investment rate to get back to the growth rate that they're missing, that they promised. So they're basically throwing a bunch of money at the problem because they're in a tough market that's not getting good returns. When you see a headline like this, that's what you need to be thinking about. You have to go beyond the headline itself. You have to be thinking about these key value drivers because it's telling you a lot about what's happening to the firm just in this headline. If you understand how the pieces of the puzzle put together, and that's what you're going to understand this semester. You need to understand this walking out of this class. That's what makes you a good analyst. That's what makes you a nuanced analyst that will be attracted to the Wall Street crowd and to the financial crowd. So essentially, that's what's happening here. Scenario number four. What if business A had a negative spread? What if they grew? Is growth good? 6%, 7%. They're destroying value at a faster rate. This is what I mean by accelerant. So what do you do if you're business A and you're in this situation? What do you do with your growth? Slow it down. So back to 5, 2, 1, negative 3. You disinvest. Don't throw money after bad projects. You'll actually become incrementally more valuable. So I'm telling you is if you understand these core principles, you will understand what's really happening directly with stock prices. Let me give you one last example before we leave that I showed at the earlier class. 
You heard of a company called McDonald's? I'm sure you guys have all experienced McDonald's at some point in your life. You know, healthy, bad, fast food. <clears throat> all right, so here's the thing. I want to evaluate their stock price. So one nuance of this formula is we can use the exact same formula with slightly different language, slightly different formulas, to basically accomplish the same value answer. Meaning, profit is no plat, but if I want to do an actual price to earnings ratio, profit becomes net income. Growth becomes growth in earnings per share. Return becomes return on equity because it's the return to the shareholders, which is the earnings per share, cash flow to shareholders, price to earnings multiple, price per share divided by earnings per share, and risk becomes <coughs> cost of equity. So I can use the exact same formula to get an actual price to earnings multiple, but instead of using ROIC, which is the return on the debt and equity, I use ROE, which is just the return on the equity, no plat, which is the cash flow to the debt and equity becomes net income, which is just the cash flow to the equity. WAC is the discount rate of the debt and the equity becomes cost of equity, which is the discount rate of just the equity cash flow. Net income is the equity cash flow. So here's the point. I go to Bloomberg and I look up McDonald's, get a current quote, Mickey D's, and I go to um, RV, or sorry, EEO, and I get the earnings estimates for McDonald's, and I switch it to an annualized basis. One of the things you'll get in your book reading is that what matters more is next year's expected earnings, the so 2015 expectation for McDonald's. Net income next year for McDonald's expectation, 57.76. 57.76. Earnings growth for McDonald's is long-term growth rate in earnings per share. Think forever. So I'm going to say 2% as a starting point. We can always change it. But I'm going to say McDonald's is going to grow a little less than the U.S. economy because people are starting to worry about quality of fast food. So maybe they're under a little bit of a pressure. But we can see. Return on equity for the next three years, 35%, 36%, 39%. So let's call that 36%. And cost of equity today for McDonald's, if I go to the WAC, discount rate 7.3% cost of equity today. If our formula holds true, it should give me a value and a multiple for McDonald's. It should give me a value of 103 billion and a multiple of almost 18. Well, right now their forward multiple based on next year's earnings is 15.4, 15.38. So if I plug in a growth rate of 1%, I'm at 15.4. They're worth a little over $89 billion according to our model. And if I do share price times shares outstanding at McDonald's, today it is market cap 97.25. I'm within a billion dollars of their actual stock price. Not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. <clears throat> I'm just telling you, forget about the Harvard Business School cases. This stuff is what the pros are using. This is what they were trained to think about in business school. These are the people that are working for the banks and institutions, and these are the people that are pricing things. The thing about valuation is there's an art to it in the science. The science is actually not that hard. You'll learn the science pretty quickly. It's the art of understanding the expectations and what goes into the formulas. That's where careers are made and broken on Wall Street. Warren Buffett's better than everybody else because he's had better insights in the expectations. That's why we're going to start with EIC because it's how we understand the industry, the dynamics, and the future that go through these equations is going to have a lot to do with our predictions. But nonetheless, I also want to show you that what I'm showing you is real. Okay? And we can do this for a lot of different firms. And this is where we're going to pick up on Wednesday.